And for more on travel and transportation, I'm joined by Anjal Lilmonkas, who is VP and Managing Director for Asia Pacific at Booking.com, and Christopher Zegras, who is Lead Principal Investigator at Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. Chris, Anjal, great to have you both on the Thank program. You Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Well, we can't talk about the future of transport and travel without talking about the technologies at your disposal today. And Andre, why don't we start with you? Because the travel and tourism sector has seen a real transformation in what is available from technologies. I mean, what are you seeing today that you think will reshape the next few decades in the industry? Yeah, I think there are several things, right? One of the things that, that we are in, very interested in, in booking is the uh, customer behaviors towards super apps, right? Mm -hmm. Or towards one platform where you actually can get all the services that you want. And for the travel industry, we also believe that that is going to be the case. And that's why at Booking.com we want to uh, deliver and build the connected trip, what we call, which is delivering services and products from the beginning of the trip until the end of the experience. And does this mean a mobile-only future? Yes, uh, mobile definitely is extremely important, right? In particular, when you see uh, in places like here in Asia Pacific, mm. how important it is. It's uh, mobile first or even mobile only, right? And definitely, as um, the amount of travelers coming from APAC expands in the future, definitely the mobile is going to be a very, very important device in the future. And Chris, you're studying mobility from a little bit of a different viewpoint, and that's with what it is doing in terms of urban transport and changing the way in which we commute or just travel, perhaps on shorter distances, not only for leisure. What is most exciting to you in the world of technology Well, today? I think it's quite analogous to what we heard um, uh, with respect to or companies like Booking.com. Uh, the personalization of the services, the movement towards expected end-to-end -end, mm. um, packaging of options. So not only what modes you might take, whether it's a Grab or your own car or the MRT here in Singapore, but where you might go and what you might even know about the destinations, how long it might be the queue to get in if it's a restaurant. So in fact, I think, I believe we'll start seeing companies like Booking.com at the urban scale, where your what you might want to do on a given day is offered to you in the morning and you make that choice and you don't think about paying for it it comes at the end of the day your mobile device becomes your platform for payment is that an area that is compelling to booking.com yeah definitely we want to deliver actually every part of the single trip right whatever it is transportation from the airport to the property or from the property to an attraction but also all the things that you can do in destination right attractions and places that you want to visit places that you want to go and of course, accommodations, right? I mean, uh, Booking.com historically has been always focused on accommodations, and accommodations will be our core business, but definitely expanding in the rest of the verticals and services, uh, it's very, very important for us. It's interesting, though, Chris, because what you're alluding to are technologies that improve the consumer experience, or the one who is taking that transport, but it's not changing transport overnight. I mean, you're talking about perhaps giving you an alert of a delay on the subway or the MRT. It's not necessarily taking those delays away. No one's jumping on the Hyperloop <laughs> right now, are they? Correct. It's not necessarily taking the delays away, but it's making the trip more re reliable. Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds awkward. I mean, it sounds perhaps inaccurate, but in fact, if I know it's going to be 15 mm -hmm. minutes late, and I know that well in advance, well, then I can build that into my life. It, it will make the entire experience less stressful. You can alert your destination that you're going to be late. Um, but I think we're, what you're seeing that platform-based mobility is, is enabling is that um, the idea of ownership is changing. Mm. Um, you know, I'm from the United States where vehicle ownership is a given. Um, but you are starting to see third parties step in and take, take the technology away from you and then you, we as the user just care about mobility as a service. Um, you can start thinking of this as a high-tech utility where I actually don't care. I get up in the morning and I know I can tell someone or a company what my travel needs will be for that given day, and they take care of all the bookings. Mm. And I don't think about it at all. It's interesting that you bring up the point that in the US, car ownership is a given. I mean, I grew up in car country outside Detroit, and I've always felt that way. But living out here in the broader region, do you think the fact that that perception is perhaps different makes the transformation to urban mobility easier? Well, I think, I don't believe that fundamental consumer culture is, is actually that different, this desire to own personalized mobility. Um, what I think is, um, and you see this even in Singapore, where vehicle ownership is three times as high as it is on average in the United States, where vehicle usage is actually much more high, highly priced. Um, and yet you still see people love their cars. Mm. And in fact, people have a tendency here to buy even more luxurious cars, because once you've 
paid that much, you may as well pay a little bit more. Right. And so, There's and and models, I <laughs> and I also think you see this in other parts of the region. China, for example, has a very uh, ambitious car culture. Yeah. Um, so there's as much symbolic utility of vehicle ownership as there is practical utility. I think technology, the digitalization of mobility is changing that, but we'll see. Chris brings up another good point, which is in some ways the technology almost seems to be ahead of consumer preference. Is that something you find? Do you find that there are tools at your disposal that the consumer perhaps just isn't interested in? Well, it's, it's interesting, right? Because we see our customers, um, when they book a property, that they ask us uh, to be able to deliver other parts of the trip, and transport mm -hmm. is one of those. I think that they expect technology to remove all the friction in, in micro moments of the trip, and they take that technology for granted and that that has to happen. And this is where we see the potential in the future too, right? To make sure that we are able to remove that friction that you might find in trip through technology. In order to do that though, to assist the customer in that way, you have to have access to their data, their location, their preferences for travel. And this has raised some concerns among consumers as well. So mm -hmm. how do you balance that? Answering the call for greater technologies and more convenience, but also ensuring people that the data is secure. Yeah, at Booking.com, uh, data privacy and everything related to that topic is extremely important, right? And in the, in the flow of years, we have been investing a lot of technology in terms of human resources, but also in machine learning, right? Mm. And we're making sure that uh, our guests are totally covered, because uh, at the end of the day, that's what we're here for, right? To deliver a service, but also in, a, in the best way possible. And uh, we're seeing that the consumers um, are appreciating uh, the way that we use machine learning. And there are several aspects that we're doing, right? Indeed, one of those could be in terms of recommendations of what to do next, mm -hmm. and also on how we display uh, certain features in our uh, platforms, right? right? From the search and which type of properties we want to show you, depending on the uh, trips that you've done in the past, mm -hmm. from what are the destinations that you want to go to. And then uh, another piece of machine learning that we are uh, using very high is in terms of translations, right? Our, our platform in mobile and in web uh, it's translated to more than 43 languages, and we use machine learning in order to, to deliver that service in, a, in an excellent way. So at some stage, is the machine going to be so smart, or is it already, that it knows where I want to go on my next holiday before I've even thought of it? <laughs> yeah, that, that would be the idea, right? To <laughs> make sure that, that recommendation else. is as accurate yeah. as possible. And uh, yeah, we're investing a lot, in, and we're seeing the, the initial results, and it's pretty mm. positive. And Chris, I wonder to what extent the data concerns enter into your research because also when we're talking about urban planning, autonomous vehicles, there's so much fear out there too that there'll be more vulnerabilities to hacking, to cyber attacks as well. Yeah, so I think there's various aspects of the data that are relevant. Since I'm a researcher, mm -hmm. we, st we equally want to understand consumer behavior, but mm -hmm. we will typically try to gather this data ex purposefully, and so this means surveys that people opt into. And we get high resolution data that is quite invasive, but it's under strict research ethical protocol. Um, not because we're better, but it's just because we have to. Um, so that's one aspect that has really enriched our ability to predict behaviors for the purposes of transportation planning, for urban planning. Um, that's changing the way we can, um, it's really enhancing our ability to model behavior. We're also seeing an increased application of machine learning techniques, which is, on the one hand, making uh, increasing our strength in predictive behavior, but it also has its weaknesses, in my opinion, because it doesn't allow us to understand the underlying causes explicitly. And that is important when we're trying to predict what might happen with new policies. If you implement road pricing, if you increase the price of um, the, the MRT, for example. Uh, there's another area of research that is the use of all of the data, um, the, 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 the footprints that is generated by cell phone activity and MRT, uh, smart cards on transactions and so forth. This is a lot more challenging. Um, one, because uh, of the invasive nature of it mm. and how do you use this in a way that complies with the telcos need to keep this anonymous and people's own, our rightful desire to keep some of this sure. private. Um, then you also asked about the uh, vulnerability of the coming automation of mobility. Right. I mean, it, mobility is autom auto already automated, but it's going to become increasingly automated. And I do believe the cybersecurity the threats are real, and 
people are working on it? <laughs> well, and this is one reason why we've heard from so many that the policymakers, the regulatory side, will be critical when it comes to advancing further modes of technological transport, if you will. How do you think that compares in Singapore and Asia Pacific more broadly versus what's taking place in the US where you spend quite a bit of time? Well, uh, Singapore has been, ex I would say, I don't know too much about other parts of the region. Mm. Um, Singapore has been very much at the leading edge of um, the incorporation of automated mobility. Um, there's already pilots. Uh, some of that has come out of our lab. Um, uh, and in terms of the political, uh, the policy apparatus, they're also well ahead. Mm -hmm. um, the US is very cautious. Um, and I think rightfully so, although because we live in this federal system where states can experiment, in fact, you're seeing a lot of experimentation and you're seeing a lot of companies been given space to experiment, mm -hmm. um, sometimes in ways that nobody actually knows about. And I think that is a little bit um, scary. And it does seem that in some ways, regulatory concerns have been holding autonomous vehicles back in the way of making them mainstream, if that's fair. Do you think? No, I think the technology's not ready. Technology's um, not ready. It's, it's ready in certain niches, and I think, but I, for widespread application, I, we're not ready for mm. our cars to be driving us. So if we're not ready for cars to be driving us, are we ready for cars to be flying with <laughs> some of these experiments you see? Almost uh, like flying cars, not quite like the Jetsons. But. Um, well, the, we've had helicopters for many, many, many years, <laughs> including in urban settings. Uh, there's a lot of um, physical constraints mm -hmm. to widespread use of human passenger travel in urban areas, right. whether it's a helicopter, whether it's a electric um, unmanned vehicle, mm -hmm. um, because uh, adding that third dimension is very complicated. You can't get that much throughput. You can't pa move that many passengers in an urban space in the air. Well, that makes me wonder over at booking.com, Angela, is this something people talk about? Will you be providing bookings one day for Let's not call them flying cars, but drones or any sort of variation, because there are so many companies at least experimenting with this idea. Yeah, so at the end of the day, we follow the customer, right? Yes. So if the customer wants a flying car, we will try to, to get there. Uh, but today, I would say that what we're trying to do is, is several things in terms of transport, mm -hmm. right? As I said before, um, we are providing uh, rental cars options in more than 35 mm -hmm. countries here in Asia Pacific through our platform. And also, we are partners, uh, we're partnering with uh, certain companies like Grab, for example, right? right? Where uh, we're going to be able to, to have the uh, hailing uh, car in our app directly uh, through Grab, which is something which we are very excited in this part of the world, right? But also to understand uh, how public transport might work. And we are testing in certain uh, cities in, in Europe the fact of giving uh, different options to the customers when they arrive to the destination and trying to yeah. see what different options they have and which is the best that fits to them uh, in terms of a budget, in terms of time. And I think that that piece is quite important because again, going back to the friction of the, of the trip, uh, when you arrive into a particular country that not necessarily is your own language, that you might sure. not have the currency, that piece of the, of the trip, sometimes there's a little bit of friction. And if we can do that in an easy way through technology, we're gonna go for it for sure. And I would imagine with the rising affluent middle class in many parts of the world, including right here across mm -hmm. Asia where we're sitting, you're seeing more cross-border travel, is that right? Yeah, I think the uh, travel industry, it's, uh, it's growing and we are feeling very comfortable and in particular in this part of the world where you can see also the online penetration, it's still in 54%, which that means there's still a lot of room to grow. And with that and the age of the population, which is booming, we're seeing more and more travelers, which is great for the travel industry. And what are you seeing in the China travel market more specifically? Because I understand you've teamed up with a lot of the domestic players there. You have partnerships mm -hmm. with C-Trip, with Meituan. Is that the strategy? Is it paying off? Well, look, uh, we're seeing China as, uh, as a long-term investment too, right? Uh, we think that the potential there and the opportunity is big, and therefore we're going to keep, uh, mm -hmm. keep investing there. We have a partnership indeed with, with Didi, which is something similar that we have with Grab, where we, customers can have uh, a car in our app and to provide that service. And uh, at the end of the day, look, we are a, a global company, right? We are in, in uh, more than 200 countries operating globally. And uh, China is one of those opportunities in the long term that we are very interested in. I just want to end the discussion by looking ahead, if we could, to let's say 30 years from where we are today. Are there any moonshot projects out there that look particularly exciting or even viable to you that we would be discussing as 
realistic transportation 30 years from now? I think the great moonshot personally will be the platformization of urban mobility. So I would love to see a company like Booking.com where I've not only booked my trip to Beijing, mm. but all of my local travel is also contained in a platform. So I know exactly how I could take which vehicle. I, I've purchased all of my necessary transit passes already. Um, I've purchased my DD um, trips. I have, have access to my local bike share. Um, I think that that is an important element towards a key imperative for mobility globally, including international travel, which is the decarbonization. Um, we need to decarbonize, and I think um, doing this in platform-based mobility will be, um, is the moonshot. I'm glad you brought decarbonization up because I do want to give you a chance to give your moonshot project, but how much pressure are you under at Booking.com to address consumers' concerns about carbon output, about CO2 emissions? I mean, we hear now this concept of flight shaming, and fewer people perhaps are looking at taking flights. Is that something you're seeing in the behavior of consumers? Well, our, our mission as a company is to uh, actually help uh, people and everyone to experience the world, but there has to be a world to visit, right? And therefore, we as a platform, we are really uh, taking sustainability very seriously. A couple of examples of that would be our uh, Booking Booster project, uh, which is something that basically we are uh, giving grants uh, to the point of two million uh, US dollars last year to startups and companies that they are doing uh, their business in order to improve the uh, sustainability of, um, in the world, right? And these are things that, that we are going to continue focusing in. To the point also that we are also testing in our display and front end to uh, put certain relevant taggings to properties that they are eco-friendly mm -hmm. and they are taking care of sustainability. And also one of the reasons is for the ecosystem itself, but also for the customers, because we're seeing that more and more customers are really taking care of these things and they are very interested in it. And, and we want to give the uh, enough visibility to this topic. Okay, and Angel, as promised, I will give you a chance to say what Moonshot Project today looks realistic in 30 years. Are we going to be booking space travel on Booking.com, or is it something else? Yeah, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm very aligned with Chris in that point, right? In the sense that um, we believe on, on one uh, connected trip, right, so to speak, and one uh, travel platform that is going to give you all the uh, options that you might want to have in a trip. And not only the options, but also to give you the support, right? Uh, mm. Would be great to have the, the same service of support if you have a problem when you book an accommodation, on where you're going to enjoy an attraction, and while well, you're traveling. So we believe that that is the future, and this is what Booking.com is going to look forward to build. We'll leave it there then. Angel, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to thank speak you. with us here thank today. I do appreciate it. Thank appreciate you. It.